Well, hey guys, today I want to explain what's going on with the recent FDA warning against mousse or foam sunscreens. Are they dangerous? misleading? Let's discuss. So on August 6 of this year, 2025, the FDA released warning letters to five companies, including Supergoop, Vacation, Kalani Sunwear, k and Care Organics, and Taizo, concerning their foam or mousse or whipped sunscreens. So why is the FDA issuing a warning about sunscreen mousses or foams? What's the question exactly? Well, under the current United States over-the-counter sunscreen regulations, only a certain dosage form lotions, creams, gels, sprays, and sticks, as well as powders, are actually permitted. So rearranged or novel forms like foams or mousses are not included, meaning that if a manufacturer wants to sell these, they actually have to submit to the FDA a new drug application, abbreviated NDA, or a special order form, which none of these companies have actually done. So are the sunscreen mousses and foams and whipped formulas being targeted unsafe? Are they dangerous? No. The FDA never actually said that these forms are unsafe, and that's important because a lot of times people take certain inflammatory, eye-catching headlines out of context or don't get the full context and think, oh my gosh, this is somehow harmful. So it's important to know what exactly the FDA meant by issuing these warnings. In fact, these sunscreens, they do meet the SPF testing regulations, meaning they have been demonstrated using the standardized appropriate test to offer the protection that they say they do. However, if you know anything about how this test is done, it's done in a testing condition where a given amount of sunscreen is applied to test subjects in a certain way and artificial sources of UV are put on the skin in order to measure protection, basically. I mean, that's just kind of a very abbreviated description of how um, this testing works. It's called minimal erythematous dosage testing or MED testing. The problem here is that mousse or foam or whipped formulations are not not dosage formulations that are approved under the current regulations. They're not recognized under the current over-the-counter monograph for sunscreens. Sunscreens in the United States, they're regulated as over-the-counter medications. It's not just the active ingredients in the sunscreen, but the formulation overall, the vehicle, the dosage form, that is also part of over-the-counter monographs. In other words, say for example, another over-the-counter medication in the United States, Tylenol. You have various dosage forms of Tylenol liquid Tylenol, chewable Tylenol, Tylenol that you swallow, gel tabs, but you're not gonna go into the grocery store and buy a box of cereal with Tylenol in it. Cereal is not an approved way to dose Tylenol. So when it comes to over-the-counter medications, the dosage form is likewise really important. To cut to the chase, marketing a sunscreen foam or a whipped sunscreen or a sunscreen mousse is basically illegal because it's not a lotion, a cream, gel, powder or spray. What's the big deal though with these if they have been shown to offer the SPF? So what if it's a different dosage form? Well, one of the major concerns around foams, mousses, whipped formulations, do they actually allow for the sunscreen to be deposited on the skin to a sufficient density um, in real world use conditions? That is a big unknown here. So basically, if you're not aware, in order to get to the SPF stated on the label, you have to apply quite a bit of sunscreen. It's actually two milligrams per centimeter squared. Now, consumers have a difficult enough time doing that with the creams, the lotions, the gels, let alone the sprays and the powders and the sticks, which are all subject to skip areas and under applications as is. So this other dose form, what the question becomes, is that something that is actually allowing consumers to put enough sunscreen on the skin? You see a foam is a little bit tricky because there's a lot of air in it. So it's kind of hard to gauge how much you should be be using. Like you've all come across recommendations for the half a teaspoon to the head and neck of a sunscreen. Well, if we're talking about a foam, mm, that all goes out the window. You're going to need quite a bit more. In other words, the foam may inadvertently be delivering lower quantities of sunscreen onto the surface of the skin, ultimately leading to suboptimal protection, unprotected sun exposure, sunburn risk increases, sun damage risk increases. Another big concern with the mousse foam whipped sunscreen 
sunscreen formulations is one brand in particular, I will say, which I reviewed a couple of years ago, the Vacation brand. They kind of blur the lines between sunscreen, which is an over-the-counter medication, and is this whip topping in a can? It looks very similar, meaning for a small child, you run the risk that they see that foam packaging kind of looks like dessert with the marketing materials. Could they accidentally mistake it for whip topping and ingest a bunch of it? One thing I often point out in a lot of my shopping videos, when I come across different over-the-counter medications that are being marketed with different flavor profiles, I really side-eye that type of marketing because I think it's very easy to blur the lines between medication, where you're only supposed to take a specified dose, and full-on candy. And for a small child, they might not really be able to tell the difference, especially when a lot of these over-the-counter medications are really, really tasty, like the different marketing around Tums with the bright colors and the different flavors and everything. Like a child might come across that and just think, oh, this is basically candy and eat a whole bottle. And then, you know, that can be really harmful in the long run. Well, when we're talking about sunscreen, I think <laughs> the enjoyment of eating sunscreen is going to be quickly diminished once they get the first taste. I can't imagine it is delightful. But nonetheless, it, when it comes to over-the-counter medications, it's really, 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 really important that things be communicated clearly and accurately as possible, basically to protect consumers. So what now? Well, I believe these companies have 15 working days to respond to the FDA with what their plan is moving forward, but many of them have already taken these formulations off the shelves, off the counter, they have withdrawn them. This is simply voluntary, either for the sake of compliance or simply for the sake of public confidence. Many times brands will withdraw a product from the market and it is often assumed by many people, especially people creating videos online that they withdrew from the market so it must have been toxic or defective. But sometimes they just remove things from the market out of an abundance of caution or basically to remove themselves from potential scrutiny or uh, litigation. For example, check out my videos from a couple of years ago with regards to the sunscreen and benzene controversies. You know, if you were following that story, you know that the benzene found in those sunscreens was negligible. The FDA was not able to re reproduce the results of that one-off lab. But in the face of, of that controversy, many brands just withdrew those products from the market out of an abundance of caution, not because they had been proven to necessarily have those harmful chemicals in a harmful amount or that they were causing harm to people, but just, you know, they withdrew them until further testing had been done. But a lot of people reacted to that, at least on TikTok, making these inflammatory videos that these brands, their sunscreens were found to cause carcinogens and they've been withdrawn for the market. They're guilty. Da, 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 da. It's not exactly how it played out. And this is kind of a similar thing. Like basically the FDA issued a warning because whipped foam mousse formulations of sunscreens are not under the over-the-counter monograph for sunscreens. You can't technically sell them as such and therefore they kind of got a little slap on the wrist and they're likely going to just withdraw them from the market rather than argue with the FDA and try and come up with data and rather than try and come up with a new drug application to the FDA they're likely going to just withdraw them from the market I would assume but only time will tell what actually happens so if you have one of these what should you do should you throw it out is it toxic is it harmful is it going to damage your skin mm, no um, it's not toxic it's not harmful the main risk with mousse foam or whip formulations is there's kind of an unknown as far as how well they deposit sunscreen ingredients on the surface of the skin compared to the approved uh, dosage forms lotions creams sticks gels sprays powders and y'all know from my videos powders don't apply hardly any sunscreen reliably on the skin so there's that but I digress so basically just be aware of the fact that if you use these um, you may be more vulnerable to a sunburn due to to inadequate application as they do contain a lot of air. So I think I pointed this out in my review on the vacation sunscreen. You kind of have to use the entire can in order to get like one application on. So it's kind of a little bit of a gimmick, but the foams, mousses, whipped formulations, they're better than no sunscreen. So if that's the only sunscreen that you like enough to use, it's better than nothing. I wouldn't throw it away. It's not harmful to your skin per se, unless of course you are going out and tanning and that is the only thing you have on and it's under dose, then you can see how it can become a problem. The main takeaway from this is that when it comes to sunscreens here in the US, they are regulated as over-the-counter medications.
instructions. So they have to follow the playbook. They have to follow the rule book um, and they can't really deviate. And that's not necessarily because the FDA just likes making little bean counter type rules. It's basically to have measures in place to keep the public safe. That's not to say when the beans are not accounted for and somebody gets a, their wrist slapped that the public has been put in harm, but it's that laws have to be enforced, regulations have to be enforced in order by and large to keep the public safe. As you can see, it's a slippery slope. You have a sunscreen mousse. Well, if you can have a sunscreen mousse, could you have an ibuprofen Pop-Tart then? Um, so you can see how enforcement is really important. It's, you know, sounds like bureaucracy, but at the end of the day, it does end up serving the best interest of the public and the public health because sunscreens are intended to protect first and foremost from the sunburn and from sun damage. And we need to make sure that companies who want to sell sunscreens, that they are selling products that meet regulations to keep consumers safe and to prioritize consumer safety above and beyond, you know, jazzy marketing claims, cool packaging, cool f formulations. <laughs> regulations matter and compliance is important, not just for the ingredients, but for the overall dosage form, as well as the marketing claims made around the product. For example, the FDA does not allow sunscreens to make the claim that they are waterproof because it misleads the public into thinking that the product will not come off, which is not true. Product, sunscreens, they do break down on the surface of the skin. They don't stay on there indefinitely. So that's a claim that the FDA does not let people make. And if a brand were to come up with their own testing and show that their product stayed on the skin, um, beyond that, they'd probably have to submit forms to the FDA and that would be a lifetime before they could ever likely get that approved to be something that could be claimed, you know, because they're all sort of, they're all regulated in the same way. And so, you know, there'd have to be a lot of testing that went into that. In other words, the other key takeaway is that when it comes to applying sunscreen, proper application is key. One of the biggest reasons why sunscreens fail is that people don't apply enough. Creams, lotions, they are more likely for you to get the proper dose on the skin as opposed to sprays, sticks, definitely as opposed to powders, but the mousses, the foams, the whipped formulations, they're a bit of an unknown too as a result of all the air in the in the product. When in doubt, always apply more and of course never rely on sunscreen alone. You always want to rein in other sun protective behaviors like hats, sleeves, seeking shade, and just don't stay out during peak sun exposure times for prolonged periods of time. And those, you know, all those behaviors taken together can really add up to keep your skin healthy and protected from the sun. Anyways, guys, that's what I wanted to chat about with you all in today's video with regards to the sunscreen mousse foam whip formulations that have sort of received a slap on the wrist. But you know, there are many other possible reasons why a sunscreen might fail, even if it meets all of the FDA regulations as it should for an over-the-counter medication, you still may may have a sunburn despite all of, all of that regulation. So why might that be? Well, on the insulate is is going to be a video that I did a few weeks ago giving common common reasons why sunscreens fail so definitely check that one out next if you missed it but if you like this video give it a thumbs up share it with your friends and as always don't forget sunscreen and subscribe I'll talk to you guys tomorrow bye mm -hmm.